you will be able to see your 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 video screen um so if you're you're not wanting to be seen on camera do turn your video off but it is lovely to see so many faces so if you are able to keep your video on that's lovely um because it feels like we're looking at a great big crowd of people um rather than black screens so thank you for those who are able to keep your camera on it makes it sort of feel a bit more like we're actually at an event rather than all sat in our uh, houses or actually i've made um for a special treat i've come into the office today to make sure my internet didn't cut out um so we're recording um we've we've put everyone on mute and you're not actually able to unmute yourself uh, we did that because there's just so many people here we were worried that you know someone accidentally unmutes and next thing you know their their, their kid runs in the room and they're shouting uh for them to to leave or because they want a bag of crisps or something and next thing we know we've got all different noises happening so we just thought this way is a bit easier um but we're going to try and hear from as many people as possible um during the event and we'll be able to kind of unmute you if you've got questions to ask um the other uh, bit is that there is going to be a Q&A at the end um, and the best way to submit your questions um, are by putting them in the chat to me. Um, so I'll be looking out in the chat. Delia, can I just check, have you put it so that the chat uh, is only for the hosts? Can you, can you do that as well now if, you, if we haven't done it already? Um, and so in the chat function that you should be able to see and find, um, if you direct your, your questions at Andy Chair, um, then when we get to the Q&A bit, I'll be going through those questions, picking some out and, and coming to you to hopefully ask that question. I'll repeat that again in a bit if it didn't make sense when we get to that stage. Um, also really helpful if you can change your name. Um, so you can do that by uh, right clicking on your image um, and uh, going to the rename function. Uh, and if you just change your name to your actual name and maybe if you're part of an organization, that's really helpful for us to know as well. Um, so putting that in. Um, and as I say, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end. So we're going to move on to our first uh, welcoming remarks in a moment. But before we do, uh, I'd just like to say for myself um, that I'm really honoured uh, to be chair today uh, as we consider some of the experiences of East and Southeast Asian communities since the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, in some ways, I felt a bit uneasy uh, about being chair uh, because I understand that the job may better sit with someone who is themselves a member of British East or, or Southeast Asian community. Um, however, uh, this event isn't only focused on the experiences of British uh, East and Southeast Asian people. It's also, also focused on what we all do uh, as a society and should be doing to tackle the rise in hate crime for those communities. Um, it's not only on victims of identity-based violence or hatred or prejudice to stand up against those harms, it's on all of us. Um, and I'm delighted that today we've been joined by uh, the Minister for Countering Extremist, Extremism, who leads at the Home Office on Hate Crime Prevention. I'm delighted we've been joined by the Met Police, uh, East and Southeast Asian-led organisations, uh, Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant of Greater London, and by members of Brent Council. Um, I'm delighted we've been joined by all these different groups because it takes a whole society to end hate. It's the responsibility of each and every one of us. And I'm proud to be able to chair this event, uh, to stand in solidarity with British East and Southeast Asian communities, and to pledge that I and Protection Approaches will continue to do all we can to be the best allies we can be. Uh, so that's uh, about it for me. I'll be introducing speakers um, as we go on. Um, and now I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce the person who will be making our first welcoming remarks. We're lucky enough to be joined uh, by Sir Kenneth Elisa, uh, OBE, Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant of Greater London, uh, a businessman, a philanthropist, uh, the first black Lord Lieutenant of Greater London, um, and a person who sits on the board of companies, both public and private, in, uh, or has sat on the board of many companies, both public and private in the UK, USA, and Africa. Uh, so, Sir Kenneth, over to you. Well, good morning. Thank you, Andy, and good morning, everybody. And, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is a very important discussion, and I'm delighted to see how many people have signed and joined this morning. Uh, when I'm asked about what being British means, I travel a lot, I meet a lot of people, as you've just heard in that introduction, in various different guises. 
and we are a fascinating nation to others. And when I'm asked that question, what does being British mean? I say that there are three things that I see that define us. One is our fundamental respect for the rule of law. The second is the language, the language of Shakespeare and Byron, but of, of business and commerce around the world. And the third is our, is our sense of humor. Now, in the context of today's topic, let's be clear, there's clearly nothing remotely funny about hate-related crime, COVID or not. Hate crime, in any of its guises, is frankly disgusting. To attack someone without provocation is unpardonable in any circumstances, but there is something particularly revolting to see someone attacked just because of the way they look. Now, fortunately, in a nation where the respect for the rule of law is so key, such actions are against the law. They're criminal, simply, and it's important that victims and their families and the families and friends of perpetrators, or at least those who count themselves as civilized, inform the police of any plans or actions of which they are aware, which will lead to hate crime in any form. And thirdly, the power of language, the language that defines us, must be a force for good and not one for evil. Unfortunately, in current circumstances, leaders around the Western world need assistance in appreciating this. There is, tragically, a current practice of blaming China for everything that is wrong in the world, from un unemployment to the pandemic. This is a, an unfortunate, in my view, feature of the current state of global politics. Now, those of us who live and work in this great city have no power to affect the realities of global politics. But we can put pressure on our own politicians, our own leaders, to avoid the careless conflation, the careless bringing together of a nation's leaders, the Chinese a government, and the people whose heritage may be traceable back to the Asian continent. To pick on people who look, quote, Chinese, is as stupid as to pick on people who look French or African or English. It, it's meaningless. And we must learn that that careless use of language is very, very dangerous. Now, positively, the overriding experience in London of the pandemic, and I've seen this firsthand as Her Majesty's representative in this great city, has been of citizens of all hues and backgrounds and heritages and ages, neighbors and strangers coming together to help each other. The building of food kitchens, the delivery of food, the shopping for old people. It's been a wonderful experience as we in London have fought against the dangers of the virus. It's vital that we work together to use the power of the law and of language to ensure that that milk of human kindness that I've just described, that we've experienced over the recent difficult months, drowns the forces of evil, which are the subject of today's programme. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for those uh, remarks, Sir Kenneth, and I, I couldn't agree more um, with, with everything you said there. Um, next up, we have some welcome remarks from, uh, again, one of the um, partners who helped us to um, organise uh, this event and supported Chinese Welfare Trust to organise the event. Um, so we have the Mayor of um, Brent Council, it's Councillor Ernest Ezzadrugi, uh, and who's joined also by um, the Cabinet Lead for Brent on Community Safety and Engagement, uh, Councillor Promise Knight. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Andy. And thank you for the organisers. And thank you, Saken, for your brilliant uh, words. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Councillor Ernest Ezadu. I'm the Mayor of uh, London Borough of Brent. I'm pleased to be with you all today to raise awareness during Hate Crime Week. These are the experiences of racism during the pandemic on the Chinese and East Asian, Asian communities. I would like to acknowledge the other speakers present today, and I look forward to listening, learning, and understanding. Also want to acknowledge all of you, many London mayors who joined, and also Mayor Sim, who 
headed the organizing this event today. As the mayor of Brent, we celebrate that we are one of the London's most diverse borough and the borough of culture for 2020. We embrace the var variety, the rich blends of culture and differences our communities bring. However, we also understand that not all share in embracing this diversity. In February this year, in collaboration with the DL, May Simle, Brent celebrated the first Chinese New Year with a growing population of Chinese in the borough, which is in line with our pursuit in building a stronger community and making sure that no community is left behind in Brent. I was angered by what I read in the newspapers and watched in the media of innocent Chinese and East Asian being attacked, discriminated, and marginalized due to the fear and perception of their involvement within the coronavirus, that the far right was using this as an opportunity to drive fear and hate among others. This year, above any other, we are all having to live differently as we navigate through a global pandemic. It is abhorrent that there were 457 reported cases to the police of Chinese and Oriental victims of racial hate, hate crime from 1st January to 30th of June, 2020. Even one victim is too many as the effect of the individual, their family, and the wider community can be debilitating, crushing. The figure is no reflection of the level of underreporting, which we know that takes place with hate crime offenses. As a community, I am aware of your rich history. You are very strong, private, respectful, and loyal as a people. These are amazing qualities to have, and we should not let any form of hate or abuse destroy our communities. My own plea is that we must stand firm and report any and all forms of abuse, especially hate crime. Those who are offending can only learn this is wrong if we challenge it. The police and government can only take action if it is reported. In Brent, we have no place for hate. And I hope after the session today, you too can feel renewed and focused with a shared commitment. Please also try to take away from the session something you can share with others to help eradicate hate and discrimination. At this point, I would like to, fellow, to invite my fellow counselor, Promise Knight, Brent lead member for community protection to share an overview of our approach in Brent. Thank you again for inviting me and thank you for our many participants today for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm, my name is um, Councillor Promise Knight. I'm the lead member for community safety and engagement. No place for hate. It is a statement of intent for Brent in our fight against hate crime. It was adopted in early 2018 and is now delivered across Brent and has formed an annual campaign for us to promote reporting and identify routes of support for victims. Now more than ever, we must be aware that in this febrile world, words have consequences that multiply with time. Hate crime impacts victims and survivors, but it also emboldens and engenders a further vicious cycle of hate. In Brent, we have nearly 4,000 Chinese and East 
Asian residents out of a population of nearly 345,000. And whilst this is a relatively small community, we are absolutely aware that if we do not speak up for them now, there won't be a chance to do so tomorrow. From January to June this year, 2.7% of victims of hate crime in Brent were of Chinese and East Asian descent, which is higher when compared to the preceding year. We believe this to be reflective of the shared national increase of hate crime incidents directed at this community. Equally, in the digital age, between February and April, there was a 300% increase in racist and violent hashtags against China and Chinese people. Analysts identified over 600 million tweets of which 200,000 contained hate speech or anti-Chinese conspiracy theories. Clearly, we live in a world that is widely connected. And with this connectivity, we can see a shift in societal norms as hate crime can proliferate at speed. But I do believe that public attitudes and perceptions can be changed. Through increased knowledge and understanding, we are truly educate and challenge bias, discrimination. We can truly educate, challenge bias, discrimination, intolerance and racism and root it out wherever we find it. So we are here today to listen to you, to learn from you, as well as managing and adapting to the COVID-19 crisis, we must also ensure lessons are learnt to prevent the negative experiences your community has faced. And we must ensure that this is not continuously repeated. Within Brent, alongside encouraging members of our community to share their experiences, report and raise awareness through a time to talk, we are leading the way on the creation of safe havens. These are venues and locations across our communities where anyone can access as a recognized point of safety whilst they arrange additional help for report of a crime. We know that more can always be done. Today marks another chapter we are here to listen and learn from you all today and take this back to Brent to ensure your community can feel safer and stronger together. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much uh, for your comments, both Councillor Knight and Mayor Ezzedrugi. Um, really important remarks from both of you and thank you for for joining this this event i'm i'm delighted to say i think there's there's nearly 140 people in in the room now so fantastic um attendance and delighted that everyone has been able to join for this uh, important conversation and we are very lucky today uh, to also be joined um by baroness williams of trafford who's the minister of state for counting extremism at the Home Office um, and who also uh, leads at the Home Office on hate crime, uh, hate crime prevention, I should really say. Um, and I'm sure you've been very busy this week on Hate Crime Awareness Week, so we're very lucky to have you join us. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, Baroness Williams is going to also um, give us some sort of opening remarks before we move on to uh, some of our speakers. So thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Andy, and thank you for everyone who's in attendance today and for the previous speakers, because I would echo all the words that you've said this morning. Um, this year seems more than ever to be a very important year in terms of countering hate crime, uh, because right at the beginning of the pandemic, it was my observation that it was that the Chinese and uh, East Asian community came in for particular targeting 
um, of this uh, of hate crime around COVID. And I'd be really interested this morning to see what that pattern has been like over the last few months. I hope it's abated, um, but I am no by no means cer certain that it has. Um, and one of the things that I mean, I was very, I'm very pleased to see the amount of publicity there has been around this week, both on Twitter and actually just standing at the train station yesterday at Euston um, over the over the loudspeakers. Um, they were they were ask, asking people to be aware of of it and to report it if they see it. So that's really really encouraging. That actually we all seem to be coming together to try and combat it. And of course, it's not, although it's been terrible for, for Chinese and, and East Asian communities um, over the last few months, of course, Jewish community, Muslim community, any community that looks a bit different has come in to this type of hatred. Um, and I just um, make the point that uh, Ernest uh, made earlier, which is the police are there to support communities but it must be reported. It's really important that if people are uh, experiencing it or people see it, that they do report it because it's only in reporting it uh, that the police can do anything about it. But um, I think it's been a very, very tough year, but you know, we've seen the worst of people this year. We've also seen the best of people. I think Kenneth mentioned that, that you know, we've been so kind to other people this year and yet there's this undercurrent of hatred and I think both um, Ernest and Promise mentioned the far right you know they love situations like this because it gives them an excuse if you like to peddle their poisonous ideologies and um, that is what we are combating so it isn't just government it is all of us it is a responsibility of all of us to call it out where we see it and um and it is only together that actually we can have the society that we have always loved to live in there's it, there is a reason why we have migrants from all over the world in this country and it's because it's a it is a tolerant country and we don't want people um here to divide that and and and, and to and to make it something that has never been the british way of life the British way of life is a cohesive, tolerant uh, way of life. Um, and, and that's the way we want to keep it. Um, I wanted to also say something about what the Home Office is doing in, in collaboration with other government departments. So we're working with MHCLG and very closely with the National Police Chief Council so, so that we can all join together in, 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 in go as government departments to provide that reassurance to communities. And I recall, it's nothing to do with COVID, but I recall back in the days of the referendum, the Polish community felt hugely under threat. So we will always have these events that come to give extremists reason to divide our communities. And so it's never a job done, um, but I guess it's, it's about promoting that great British culture of tolerance and togetherness that we want to see continue in the United Kingdom. Um, and can I just end by thanking Protection Approaches for uh, organising this event. It's fantastic that we've got 150 people. I hate being virtual, but actually would we have got the number of people in the room had we not done this uh, virtually this morning? So it has got its its benefits and it's lovely to be with you and, and everyone's camera has been turned on um, so we can actually see each other. So thank you very much in, in, indeed for inviting me. I'm really keen to hear firsthand some of the firsthand experiences um, that people have had during this really, really difficult time. So, I, you know, you have the government's full support um, and I look forward to hearing from all of the contributors this morning. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Thank you so much for those remarks and your kind words. Um, and I agree that, that, that whilst uh, all sat separately online doesn't feel quite as, as special, it does give us all a chance to come in and be together when, when perhaps you know, getting to a, an in-person location might have been impossible beforehand. So there is some positives. Um, and also, uh, 
just your remarks about how it's not only, you know, we're focusing on East and Southeast Asian experiences today, but you're absolutely right. You know, we work with all sorts of different groups who face um, prejudice, who face hate crime, uh, who face marginalization. And, and we've heard from all sorts of different people from disabled communities, from Muslim communities, from um, uh, black communities across across the country that they too have, have found this period extremely difficult and have faced um, uh, perhaps what they feel to be high levels of, of prejudice and, and hate crime. So really important to pick up on that too. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to move now to sort of our, our three kind of speakers and, and we're very fortunate that Baroness Williams is going to join us um, and promise, Council Promise Night as well when we get to the Q&A. So you, you, you haven't heard the last from them. Um, but we're now going to hear from our other three speakers who will all be taking part in the Q&A at the end. And first, I'd like to pass over um, to How You Tam, who we're delighted to have with us today. Um, she is uh, part, she's a core organiser with the End the Virus of Racism campaign. Um, it's the first, uh, uh, it's an intergenerational group seeking to build the UK's first non-profit organization addressing systematic anti-east and southeast asian racism um how you as a community organizer campaigner writer and is here with us today over to you how um thank you very much andy for that introduction and i would like to thank um, all the organisers that have put this together uh, i'd like to especially give a shout out to jill tan who has um it, not with us today i don't think but um has been um really massive in terms of putting this event and other events together um, and I'd like to thank the three previous speakers as well. Um, so just to um, extend on what Andy was um, saying in his introduction, um, so I am a core organiser with End the Virus of Racism campaign group. Um, we formed in May this year in response to the data showing that hate crimes against um, quote unquote Chinese and uh, Asian communities had risen threefold um, in the first quarter of the year. Um, and we've continued organizing since. Um, our first demands were to call upon the Home Office to declare a zero tolerance to racism and also to launch an independent public inquiry into why um, hate crimes and racism against East and Southeast Asian communities were rising. Um, and you know, we are, as Andy has said, an intergenerational grassroots campaign group. Um, we, you know, it's a really diverse group of migrants, of researchers, of artists, um, of people who work in, you know, various um, different sectors in business, in tech. Um, and, you know, we've really grown. And just to make a make a note that we are a non-partisan group but that does not mean that we are apolitical we are very much political with a small p because very much polit politics is the reason why east and southeast asian communities are so um, disenfranchised and marginalized um, and just on that note i just wanted to um, also make a point about inclusive terminology um, this this set the webinar is about um, confronting COVID related hate against East and Southeast Asian communities. So it's very important that we put Southeast Asian communities on the agenda. Um, and um, it first starts with, with, naming, uh, with naming those groups. And it's important not to homogenize our communities as well. Um, so why do we exist? Why does End the Bias of Racism? Um, why is our work needed? Um, so as I've already mentioned, um, you know, reported hate crime rose 300% uh, against East and Southeast Asian communities in the first quarter of the year. Um, and this is in itself not necessarily reliable data because um, there is a history of underreporting in, in all BA, BAME communities due to um, distrust with the police and due to um, different conditions, you know, a lot of our community are, um, are undocumented, um, a lot of our community work in precarious sectors, and there's just not that belief that the police um, and uh, other sort of public sector institutions can necessarily support, um, can support these, uh, these, these communities. Um, and furthermore, you know, why do we exist? You know, there's, um, there's been a lot of uh, increase in um, 
online hate um, and you know this this has been shown um, this has been shown by research to have increased 900% um, over over the period of COVID. Um, also to, to highlight a, a really shocking statistic, which is that there are more Filipino frontline workers who have died from COVID in the UK than the Philippines itself, which is um, terrible when you think of um, how the UK is such a, a large economy in the world you know and we talk a lot about um the way of life here and you know how it's 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 you know inclusive and tolerant but actually there are many communities that are not that have never f felt that for themselves uh, that have never experienced that um i myself am a child of takeaway workers um and my family you know still work in that sector and in the domestic sector um and you know our communities are not represented in terms of um, in in terms of uh, say that you know COVID nineteen decision making structures and processes um, such as the London Recovery Board and uh, such as the Commission for uh, Race and Ethnic uh, Race and Ethnic Disparities I think it is um, so you know there's there's a lot of there's a lot of issues and I, I want to be here to sort of complicate the narrative that there is. Um, you know, in in the, in terms of the the UK, that you know we're all in it together. That you know um, that you know, and complicate the the narrative that you know the the UK is a sort of inclusive and tolerant place for all. Because um, as I've mentioned, the migrant communities, catering communities, you know, many many groups in our communities, this is simply not an, their lived experience. Um, let me know if I'm uh, if I'm running out of time. There's a lot of material to go through, um, but just you know, on that on that note, to kind of um, continue talking about hate crimes against our communities. So um, we're talking about microaggressions, daily racism, everyday racism that has been is not a, is not a new thing. Um, and you know, as Sarah Owen MP has said um, in numerous times in Parliament, and also on uh, I think it was Tuesday at the historic uh, debate in Westminster Hall about um, racism against East and Southeast Asian communities. Um, as Sarah Owen has said, you know, this pandemic has lifted the lid on long-standing racism against East and Southeast Asian communities. None of this is new, um, but what it is, I think, quite telling is how local authorities, government, you know, are you know, treating this as if it was something that they were not prepared for, that they were not shocked by. Um, and this, this is also something that um, has been pointed out by protection approaches in, in the briefing note that there was a lack of sort of resilience in organisations and systems to deal with COVID related racism, which, you know, we're here to talk today has faced, it has, we're here to talk today, you know, with the focus on East and Southeast Asian communities, but it is across the board as previous speakers um, have, have spoken about. It is, um, you know, we're living in the age of Black Lives Matter and, you know, this, um, th this kind of goes to show that the racism faced by, um, uh, you know, the, the, the East and Southeast Asian communities is not in isolation, it's across the piece. And um, it's something that the Public Health England report also, um, also has um, noted. So there's there's so much to say, which I think you know um, we can possibly go on to with the questions. Um, but I just wanted to also talk about what kind of visions that end the virus of racism have. So um, we we are seeking to um, build the UK's first non-profit organisation to address systemic anti-East and Southeast Asian racisms because. Um, while we came together, um, we formed in response to the upsurge of racism against our communities over the course of the pandemic. You know, we we recognised um, that we need to be dealing with this issue on a systemic level, um, and we have been tackling it on multiple fronts. So, um, I, th I think. A month ago, we hosted community conversations, which was funded by the Mayor of London, um, just to talk through various missions and um, highlight, you know, 
what we thought was missing, what we thought um, was good, and to sort of contribute to that work because, uh, as I previously mentioned, um, East and Southeast Asian voices are not represented currently in London's recovery. Um, and, you know, we, we also see that there's also a, a great need to encourage and, you know, help our communities in terms of um, building the language and the tools to deal with racism. Um, there's you, racism against East and Southeast Asian communities is so normalized. Um, and there's so much stereotyping, um, treating of these communities as um, our communities as monoliths um, that, I, you know, I, has been exacerbated by the media and by government. So um, th there is a need to kind of um, process all of this intergenerational trauma um, and there is a need to um, develop um, tools to be dealing with this. Um, raising awareness is one thing, but also um, making interventions, collaborating um, to make interventions. And um, a, a big part of our work is we're also seeking to coalition build. You know, we have a sister organization in Scotland called East and Southeast Asian Scotland, which is doing incredible work, frontline work, you know, dealing with um, people who are facing hate crimes. You know, we work with Be Seen, who are an amazing network um, looking to sort of challenge the pernicious um, media um, treatment of East and Southeast Asians, um, especially during COVID, but over a long period of time as well. And um, through the work of all of these organizations put together yesterday, no, sorry, um, on Tuesday, we were able to have the parliamentary debate tabled by Sarah Owen, which she has also described as a teamwork effort. So it's so important that as East and Southeast Asian communities, we come together, we mobilize um, and we keep on creating change because it's important that this change be led by, by our communities. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's all I wanted to say for now. Um, but very happy to take any further questions and um, be contacted that way. But thank you oh. for thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Howie. That was um, uh, wonderful remarks. Um, and I'd like to echo what Howie said at the very start um, about Jill Jill Tan, who helped organise this event and has just been doing so much work over the last number of months to uh, try and support East and Southeast Asian communities at this time and raise um, profile and understanding of what's happening and, and uh, hold lots of organisations to account to, to do more. Uh, and if anyone is uh, worthy of a damehood, it is, it is Jill. So I'll put that shout out I for agree. her. I agree. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and also on your sort of final marks about, about you know, um, community leadership uh, from, from an outside perspective of protection approaches, um, it's it, working on these issues around hate crime, I think groups like uh, yourselves uh, and the virus of racism, groups like CARG and all these other groups that at this moment have, have started doing so much work, um, mostly in voluntary uh, positions to, uh, to um, support, you know, the East and South Asian communities, but also, again, challenge organisations and local government and national government on, on what's being done about it has been um, wonderful to see and long may it continue. Um, how you will be joining us for questions uh, shortly, but now we're moving on to our next speaker, uh, who is Abdul Haq, uh, joining us from the Met. Um, Abdul, I'm going to try and put on a video before you start speaking, uh, which is going to be where everything falls to pieces and uh, the, the technology falls down and I'll probably end up throwing everyone out of the meeting or something. Um, I'm going to play two, but I'm going to play one before you speak and one after, if that's okay, because I'm going to need a second to set the second one up. Um, Otherwise, I really will make everything go horribly wrong. Uh, so, if everyone gives me just a, a split second to make this work. Here we go. Hopefully, everyone can see this. Hey, Ali Paul. I'm a police officer working for the Metropolitan Police Service. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been some hate crime directed towards our community. A hate crime is when someone commits a crime against you because of your disability, gender, identity, race or sexual orientation, religion or any other actual or perceived difference. It doesn't just mean physical violence. Someone using offensive language towards you or harassing you because of who you are or who they think you are 
is also a crime. Another example is someone posting abusive or offensive messages about you online. You might want to shrug it off if it happens to you, but if you tell us, we can investigate and stop it from getting worse for you or someone else. Even if you're not sure if it's a crime or not, you should report it so we can investigate. If it is an emergency, you can call 999. If it's non-urgent, you can call 101 or you can report crime online. Great. Um, I hope that worked very well. Uh, and no one was sort of sat there in silence wondering where we'd gone. Um, I'll set up the other one while you're speaking, Abs, uh, but I'd like to introduce Abdul Haq, uh, who is Crime Prevention, Inclusion and Engagement Officer at uh, New Scotland Yard and has been doing amazing work over the last number of months. Um, we've got to know him quite well. He's been chairing uh, a, a weekly uh, call uh, that's just moved to, to bi-weekly um, with all sorts of groups from uh, Eastern Southeast Asian communities, from local authorities, from charities, uh, from police to discuss these issues um, and really kind of taking a lead in, in that at, at the Met. So over to you, Abs. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. So my name is actually Abdul Haq. Everyone knows me as Abs. I work in a department called Crime Prevention, Inclusion and Engagement um, at New Scotland Yard. Um, so what that entails is we look at um, the actual engagement for the Met across the whole of London. Um, so my role is looking at issues and problems that affect London and actually coming up with solutions that all of the boroughs across London adopt and follow. Um, what I'd like to say is obviously we work in collaboration with local authorities, with MOPAC, with charities, with lots of other organisations because most sort of problems that we have across London are interlinked and interwoven into many different aspects which the police alone can't solve or resolve. Um, it's an actual honour and privilege to be here today, um, to be invited to this meeting and you know I really appreciate you know the time and efforts taken to organise this so thank you very much to all the organisers and thanks to all the participants for taking part in this um, as well. So this week is National Hate Crime Awareness Week um, and as an organisation um, we have embarked on doing a, a series of different campaigns to raise awareness into what hate crime is. Um, I think as well this particular event is focused more around the Chinese and Southeast Asian community. Um, and like I said, London is a very big global city, so around 9 million people with over 300 languages spoken and about 40% BAME community. So there's a lot of focus on London and obviously how we as an organisation interact with our communities. Um, I have to say we don't always get it right um, and this year has particularly been challenging because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've had obviously Brexit from you know the, the end of last year and we're in the transition period and we're coming up towards the end of that as well and as a result of the COVID-19 and the lockdowns there's been lots of frustrations in communities um, you know including the, the Black Lives Matters campaign it was George Floyd's 47th birthday yesterday there's a lot going on for London and a lot going on for our communities. And um, sadly, obviously, we picked up on the tensions across London to see um, what we could do to support our communities better. Um, in relation to this particular community group, um, the British um, East Asian and Southeast Asian communities, um, we saw quite early on that there was um, a significant rise in hate crime towards this community group. And as like some of the previous uh, guest speakers have said is, um, people have their own lived experiences about certain things. Um, and equally, as an organisation, how do we interact with our um, communities? You know, can we, are we effective in the way we communicate? Do people know where to access the information? So for me, um, we looked at how we can best achieve these things. So we created um, a lot of the videos. So the one that was played earlier was in English to target different community groups to raise you know, awareness as to, to educate the community what is hate crime. Uh, you know, encourage reporting because sometimes a, a hate crime incident could be a, a split second thing where you walk past somebody in the street and they make a remark or comment about what you look like, who you are, what they think you are. Um, hate crime incidents are actually quite significant because it's quite a personal thing on you. So quite, you know, they're likely to linger and sometimes people question, well, why did they say that to me? Why did they do that? Um, but I think, as you say, you know, historically speaking, um, this community could be very underrepresented in reporting these types of crimes. Um, so people, you know, 
are sometimes weary of the police, sometimes weary of local authorities. So again, we had to embark on a huge campaign of raising awareness, targeting different community groups to say, look, this, we, we want to encourage you to report hate crime. This is what a hate crime is. Don't worry about hate crime incident or hate crime offence. You know, we will deal with that. But unless the police as an organisation know um, what is going on out there, we can't then be present in those communities or obviously raise our level of policing to support the community in, in those areas. So like Andy was saying, you know, I, I run a forum. Um, that forum has been recognised nationally by the National Police Chiefs Council as, um, I say, leading the way. But um, we're quite quick. So we set up lots of videos in different uh, Chinese and Southeast Asian languages and dialects as well. Um, we've created a scheme called Stay in Touch where we stay in touch with some of the community groups because a lot of the community centres were closed during COVID-19. Um, the other thing that we do as well is so we off, we also mentor other police force areas. So Police Scotland, they join, join in the conference call. I've had people from Hampshire Police and other police force regions join to see how we communicate with our, obviously with our communities here. And you know, for me, it's about um, you know reaching out to those communities because we don't have all the answers. You know, we 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 really don't. And without the support of groups like Protection Approaches, Jill Tan, the lots of um, and May Sim as well, who, you know, who was instrumental in setting this up, uh, we can't do this alone. But equally, unless we as an organisation know what the issues are and they're reported to us, um, can we then try and offer that support or actually take some form of action that will um support communities and make people feel safe in, the, in, in their communities where they are. So um, that's my role really. So again, it's very challenging at the moment with all these different things going on, but um, I think it's really important that people don't think, well, you know, we can't report this. Unless it is reported, we don't know the, the, the actual volume of what's going on out in the communities. Um, I know this is a Brent-led event, so I do have a colleague um, who's from Brent Police here as well. So I don't know, Andy, if you want to bring um, Inspector Munich on for that or whether you want to continue with this and the next video. Uh, thanks. I was very happy to bring your colleague on. Um, let's put the, the video on and if you could message me the, the name, then Delia will be able to unmute in a second because we didn't have it in our list, but that's okay. We're going we're gonna to pop the second video on and uh, make it all happen. And hopefully this will work getting the second video on as well. Go 在英國來說是一個刑事的罪行什麼是仇恨犯罪呢當然這個刑事罪案除了包括不僅是人用暴力例子是例如在互聯網發布一些對於你有侮辱性的消息
Fantastic. So that was uh, the Cantonese uh, version of the video. And I wish we had time to play every single version in all the languages uh, that um, Abbas and his team have put together. Um, but we don't. Uh, Delia, we needed to go to um, Abs' uh, colleague, Monique. Oh, good morning. I am uh, Mani Bishtiak. I am the Partnership and Prevention Inspector for Northwest BCU. That covers Brent, Harrow, and Barnet. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone for allowing us to uh, be part of this group. Um, the hate crime, we recognize that the fact that hate crime is actually a lot more impactful than other crimes of the same type of nature. So even though if we, and I'm, take, I'm talking about from a Brent perspective here, even though this issue of um, hate crime is bigger than Brent, um, we recognize the fact that it has a larger impact than say normal public order would have on people like that. Um, one of the things that we from Brent want is for more representation from yourselves of when hate crime is happening and it's under reporting which is what we're concerned about over here. Um, forums like this are really important for us in that respect because they do get out the word for hate crime. A hate crime is perceived by a person who is a victim of it or someone else who's around it as well. The more you report that to us, the more we would be able to um, divert our resources towards these issues. And um, it's about resources like this during Hate Week that bring more awareness to us as well as to the community. So I just want to say thank you with regards to that. Um, it's not much else for myself. Well, okay. Thanks so much. Uh, and thanks for joining and thanks for supporting uh, the event. Um, we are going to move on to a final speaker and then go to questions. I know there's lots of questions coming in. Uh, so I know Mason uh, will be uh, not brief, but succinct in her, her wonderful comments. Um, and uh, once again, thanks to Mason from uh, Chinese Welfare Trust for really leading on the organization of, of today. This simply wouldn't have happened uh, without Mason and all the work she's put in. So, so again, Mason, thank you. I think from everyone here, uh, I say Mason is, Chair of Chinese Welfare Trust, one of a thousand different things that, that she does. Um, she uh, is uh, on the board of a number of different charities. Um, and when I was reading up about you, Miss Sim, something you've not told me before is that you are the master of the worshipful company of traders and the first Chinese person in the history of the city of London to be the master of a livery company. But welcome and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Andy. Minister, my Lord Lieutenant, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, delighted to be given this opportunity to address you this morning. You have already heard about the various excellent work that others are doing in tackling hate crime. May I now share with you the details of a project that three charities, Protection Approaches, Newham Chinese Association, and Chinese Welfare Trust are working together to confront COVID-related hate. By way of introduction, I am the chair of Chinese Welfare Trust. I am Chinese and Southeast Asian from Malaysia. I'm also Her Majesty the Queen's representative for London Borough of Brent. And I work with Sir Ken and my fellow deputy lieutenants to help build bridges across communities and a more inclusive society in London. Chinese Welfare Trust was set up 12 years ago. The founder, Stephen Perry, uh, chairman of the 48 Group Club, and also his co-founder, Eddie Chen, also the founder of Chinese National Healthy Living Center, had this vision. They wanted to set up a Chinese equivalent of Jewish care. So what we do is we do outreach work with the Chinese elderly, and we are currently fundraising to employ and appoint the first ever Chinese speaking admiral nurse to help Chinese people with dementia. 
So Admodness is an initiative of Dementia UK. We are very pleased that through the efforts of Jill Tan, and she is really energetic and tireless and has done so much uh, over the past few months to help various organizations uh, to deal with hate crime. Uh, and also um, the association that she works with, Newham Chinese Association, which was set up 26 years ago, and they do marvelous work in East London and also protection approaches. Uh, and we have together secured funding from the National Lottery Fund, as well as City Bridge Trust for a hate crime project. The funding is for six months and it is to help the British, Chinese and Southeast Asian community to deal with the rapid increases in hate and discrimination as a result of COVID-19. The project will rapidly and sustainably upskill the community organizations. And we will be providing training resources and the support that they will need. We will increase the understanding amongst the British and Southeast Asian community members of hate crime and reporting. We will implement best practice systems of third party hate crime reporting or signpost them to other reporting mechanisms. We will also support victims of hate crime and help set up counseling services. So in the process uh, of doing all this, we hope to build sustainable relationships with community groups, with local authorities, with the police, and with other service providers. Sadly, hate crime against the Chinese and Southeast Asian community is expected to increase with the loss of jobs uh, and the deterioration in the eco economy. And therefore, our project, along with other projects around the country, are vital to deal with the hate crime problem. We have an opportunity for those of you who belong to Chinese and Southeast Asian community groups in that we are selecting 21 community groups to participate in our project. There will be nine from the London area and 12 from outside London. And there is some funding for community groups that work with us on this. At this stage, we are carrying out a mapping exercise, uh, contacting various community groups that could be interested and inviting them to uh, apply by filling in an expression of interest form and sending that back to us. So at the end of the six months, we will be organizing a big conference to present the results of our work and to look at the way forward. I am so pleased that we have such a huge turnout today for this important virtual event. So we hope that you will maintain your interests uh, and help us to combat hate crime. We all need to work together effectively on this. So please keep in touch and contact us if you want to hear more about our project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mason. And uh, from Protection Approaches side, we are absolutely delighted to be working with yourselves at Chinese Welfare Trust and uh, Newham Chinese Association uh, on this new exciting project. And I'm just putting a link to everyone. Uh, I hope that works in the chat, which is an information sheet on that project. So if you are an organization or part of an organization or know of an organization, you might want to be involved, pass on that info sheet, get in touch with uh, Lisa, whose name's on there, and uh, we can talk more. Uh, it must be time for a couple of questions. Um, in, in a minute, I'm going to actually ask uh, Jabbers from Hackney Chinese Community Services to talk for one second about some leaflets they've, they've put out in lots of different languages um, 
that have information about Hate Crime Book. First, I think we'll go for a question. Um, and I've had uh, Peck San, who um, is a member of CARG, uh, which is COVID-19 anti-racism group, uh, ask a question in the chat. And I wonder if we could go to Peck San Delia to ask that question in person. Hi. Thank you for bringing me in, Andy. And I'd like to thank the speakers that spoken earlier, so Kenneth, Elisa, uh, Councillor Ernest uh, Ezejugi, I hope I pronounced that right, Councillor Promise Knight, Baroness Williams of Trafford, <laughs> Abdul, Haig, and Mason Lai. Um, I have a, a couple of questions, I'm going to summarise them. On the opening remarks from Sir Kenneth Elisa on the view of being British, how do we ensure Sir Kenneth Elisa's views of that, the rule of law, the language from literature to law and humour, will be used to tackle the undercurrent of racism? And hate which is cutting through all the kindness shown in these challenging times. Home Office Minister uh, Baroness Williams commented on the British way of life where tolerance and togetherness are key and your points were raised. How will we translate this into actionable policy uh, procedure and positive outcomes for our BESEA community and all communities to be accepted as part of the fabric of society in the UK as a whole? I turn to how you who raised the important issues of the impact of visa community and touch upon that national aspect. We have monetary groups all the way to, up to Scotland. So how are we going to support and streamline the support nationally and especially the policing because in particular more remote areas ensure that quality of policing that we have in London uh, due to the excellent outreach of the Met and the work of Abdul Haig's team. And I echo the importance of major issues affecting our economy. How do we balance this positive image of the UK with the undercurrent of racism? And I welcome the view of the speakers. Thank you for uh, those questions. And there was a lot in there. Uh, so I'd like to come back to some of the previous uh, speakers um, to come in on any bits of that they'd like. Um, Baroness Williams, are you, you're still with us, I hope. Um, would you like to come back on any of the, the, the questions in uh, what Peck Sanders said? Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a very good question about the British way of life and how we ensure that all communities feel part of the British way of life, uh, whether, whether you're in fact uh, British or not, that, that it is a welcoming and tolerant uh, country to live in. And I think that this can only be that there's there's a cult there's a British culture that is is tolerant. But how come that in that some people feel really um, really uh, ostracised for it, um, from it or isolated from it? And I think that as I said previously, I don't think there is any one single fix to this. Um, or indeed any any quick solution to it. I think that to to working together with local government, working together with community groups, which we do an awful lot, and actually working uh, with the online community, I think that that has become a bigger and bigger problem in our lives. This sort of hatred meted out online from anonymous people uh, that perpetuates through people's lives. So we can we can we're we're looking at the moment on legislation in terms of online harms. We are working together with community groups uh, through local government, and also um, some of the, uh, the the groups like Tell Mama, who uh, combat and report uh, race uh, hatred towards Muslims. The Community Security Trust, who. Um, who work, actually work with Tell Mama and also uh, report on anti-Semitism. So there are a number of groups that work together to try and combat it. But as I say, it's not one single uh, fix. We also um, have put in the last few years uh, money towards protecting places of worship, because you'll recall uh, uh, places that have been the, mo mo the mosque that was attacked um, and we work with groups who who have who combat a variety of different types of uh, hatred. So we will recall punish uh, a Muslim day that created absolute fear within the Muslim community. Very very successfully, we worked with local communities and indeed with the police to provide that reassurance that you know that Muslims were not going to be punished on um, a certain day. We work with Changing Faces who, um, who
who combat uh, hatred against people because of how they look. If they have, you know, some sort of uh, disfigurement or deformity, they can be attacked for how they look. As I say, we work with CST and we work with Tell Mama, and obviously very, very pleased to um, be speaking to you guys today. So there is just there. Are, the, the, this is a kind of multi-pronged approach. I, I guess is is how you would sum it up in a nutshell. Uh, to try and uh, combat it and of course uh, the courts will deal with it, it is it is the courts and not the police who determine whether um, uh, hate crimes uh, are are hate crimes reported hate crimes are actual hate crimes and can be and there are certain aggravated offenses so that's Thank it in a nutshell really <laughs> but um it's not a perfect or clean fix and i you know if it was we'd have sorted it all out by now but i think it's ongoing and i think it's it's both government it's civil society um who who can work through it together well thank you for those um comments um how are you on if you've got any comments you wanted to come back on Brandy, who's that? Thank you. Uh, for, how, how are you? Um, thank you. I'd like to quote um, something that Sarah Owen said that I thought was brilliant, um, which was that at this point in time, the community is having to step up when uh, the state has stepped back. So I would, um, well, sorry, by the way, I would like to thank Pexan for her question. Um, and just to respond specifically to the bit about how do we um, streamline support nationwide, I think um, uh, the government has got to be really honest about, you know, really honest with itself about how um, not only is it kind of, um, as uh, the Baroness was saying, Baroness Williams, um, you, is, is helping communities, but also the conditions that government created that mean that um, you know we do have this um, we do have a lot of these issues in the first place um, by issues I mean the disproportionate impacts towards BAME communities um, and marginalized communities that they've suffered over COVID um, you know I'm going to be working at Newham Council very soon um, and there have been cuts to public service public health services of 7.5% in real terms and that was before COVID hit um, and we all know that local authorities have faced a massive um, cut in funding over the years so the, the CVS sector that's the community and voluntary services sector is in trouble and when we talk about um, how do we support nationwide there needs to be a look in terms of how do we fund our CVS sectors how do we fund um, civil society initiatives um, it's very important to like um, the, the work that um, Abdul um, and Muneeb are, are working on is so important um, and yet we also have to develop um, you know in terms of uh, community initiatives and educational initiatives um, and that does start with um, you know uh, rectifying the defunding the situation of being defunded that community centers uh, youth centers um, are, are being faced with and it's also about tackling the hostile environment which is um, which has undergirded all of this and which people are ref frankly reluctant to talk about um, we do have to I think, in my view, do much more to be a more compassionate society. If we if we say that um, Britain is a place for the rule of law and it is a place where we um, are inclusive and just, then why have these violent border policies? You know, in just to sum up, you know, very soon on the 23rd of October, we'll have the first anniversary of the Essex 39 deaths, um, which is um, people who were victim of 39 Vietnamese people who were victims of trafficking. Um, and that's also just what is reported on the news. There's far more going on. Um, so yeah, to support nationwide, the government also needs to kind of take a, a look at itself in terms of how it perpetuates racist narratives and how it perpetuates, um, you know, um, narratives that um, emphasize the humanity of groups and individuals as being contingent on their contributions to British society or their, 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 their sort of um, the hard work and the money that they can bring in because uh, if we're to be a more compassionate society we have to um, we have to admit that this language this rhetoric which leads to policy making um, 
plays in a huge impact in terms of the disproportionate racialized impacts of COVID-19. Thank you, how are you? I'm going to have to jump in because we've only got a couple of seconds left. Um, and I'm going to try and be respectful of everyone's time and we might go over by just a couple of minutes, but we won't go over by very much if we do. Um, so Kenneth, I, I sensed you had something you wanted to add on that. Well, very quickly, uh, Pexan, thank you very much for the question. Uh, not to repeat any of the things that I said before, but one of the very satisfying um, uh, characteristics of the COVID-19 experience in London has been the emergence and the empowerment of micro charities and I define a micro charity as one for whom five thousand pounds of, of funds would make a fundamental difference to what they do and they, they're operating across a whole range of ways of helping the disadvantaged the marginalized those in need to cope with things it's not just faith it's not just a, a heritage it's across a whole range of needs and I would encourage people to get involved with their local micro charities who are doing the good, making the conversations, making things happen in community. It's rather than individuals trying to do it or the very large national institutions. This, this group is, is a relatively new phenomenon. I would also encourage everybody to draw a distinction between the stick and the carrot. We've, we spent a lot this morning talking about the stick, about the law, about uh, enforcement and so on. And that's really, really important because if the society doesn't do those things, then, then society crumbles and we see that around the world. But the carrot, the positive side is breaking down barriers, is talking to people about things, is taking away the mystery of difference, which is what fuels much of the, of the hatred. And so I, I encourage, I mean, I applaud, I don't just encourage, but for example, the celebrations of Chinese New Year is an opportunity to explain to lots of people about an entire culture that otherwise is a mystery. Doing programs in schools that explain what other nations and other heritages do other religions do, again, demystifies things, allows children to have a different perspective on it. So, so I think that the carrot side is as important as the stick, but we mustn't forget this society with these fundamentally in the principles of the rule of law. We've heard the Metropolitan Police reminding us the stick is there, which means the rest of us can perhaps put a little bit more effort on the carrot side of that equation. Thank you very much for those comments. I feel terrible because it's, it's already uh, quarter two, which is the time we are due to wrap up, which means I don't think we've got time for, for, for more questions, which is there's never enough time for questions. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. I wish I could ask uh, questions going on for the next three hours uh, and beyond. But, but we have to be respectful of everyone's time because I know that we're all busy and, and on Zoom probably all the time and, and it's very difficult. Um, before we wrap up, uh, I want to do two things. Um, again, thank our, our speakers um, and everyone that's been involved today. And I just want to quickly, because we absolutely promised him we would, and I think these resources are fantastic, go to uh, Jabez, um, who is from Hackney Chinese Community Services, who have put together a fantastic set of leaflets, which I'm about to put in the chat. And just to give us one minute, Jabez, on, on, on these leaflets and why they've come about, but, but only uh, a, a short comment, if that's okay. Hello, hi, uh, uh, thank you, Andy. Yeah, and uh, I sorry, I'm uh, for some reason the, the camera is not uh, is not working, and uh, the many many speaker before me already highlighted that since the COVID outbreak, there's been a surge in the racial abuse and racial attacks towards the East and Southeast Asian, whether they are from Japan, Korean, China, Taiwan, Thailand, Singapore, Philippines, or China. This demonstrates that in relation to the experience of East and Southeast Asian in this country, we have far more in common uh, than our national differences. This booklet is a collaboration of the Hadley Chinese Community Services with the Metropolitan Police and the Hadley and Tower, Hadley and Tower Hamlet Hate Crime Unit and the Lunderborough of Hadley Community Safety Team. It is translated into seven Southeast Asian languages. Uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Chinese simplified and, tra and, and tradition, in Thai, in Japanese, in Korean, in Nepalese, and in Vietnamese. For the past six months, the East, uh, East and Southeast Asian community have been working very hard with the protection uh, approaches to raise community awareness to report in race incidents to the police. However, the work for the victims uh, does not end with reporting to the police. This booklet outlines the various process and possible outcomes after, after reporting. We, don't, we do not have the statistics on the outcome of all these reports uh, to, uh, to the police. Uh, we hope that uh, 
from the uh, confronting COVID related hate project, uh, which uh, congratulations to Liu, Liu Chinese Association, uh, Chinese Welfare Trust, and the protection approaches is going to uh, going to take forward. Uh, we are in full support of this project and look forward to the project train our community activists in supporting victims of crime, uh, victims of hate crime, on how to follow up on report to, from reporting to the police to make sure that the victim's desired outcome is achieved. Whether it's going to be going down the route of informal resolution, formal caution, prosecution, or claiming criminal, criminal injury compensation. There's a lot of work in front of us, and uh, this project is, 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 is the right, is, is the right, right junction to bring our community forward to the next step uh, in challenging racism. Thank you uh, so much for those remarks, Jabez. Um, and yes, the link to, to those uh, resources are in the chat and do spread them around uh, widely to anyone uh, who, who may be helped by them. Um, once again, I'd like to thank our speakers. Um, the, last, the last link I will put into the, the chat is um, for a, was a, a briefing that, that we were able to put together with a number of East and South East Asian groups um, ahead of a Westminster Hall debate on this issue that took place on Tuesday, um, as um, how you said, led by um, the MP Sarah Owens. And um, in this briefing, uh, and I think a lot of this has come out in the discussion today, there was, there was a number of um, recommendations that came from East and Southeast Asian community groups uh, in the UK um, about what they would like to see. And I think loads of these have come up uh, over this discussion, but but those those asks are around um, all of us, um, government, local government, organisations, actively reaching out and consulting with local grassroots community and faith groups to ensure their perspectives and expertise are included in the COVID recovery policy, um, making sure that we can prioritise psychological and trauma support. Um, in the relevant languages for those who have been victims, uh, providing quick release and early access funds for small grassroots organisations, uh, enabling them to um, lead on, on community responses in, in local communities, um, and uh, ultimately establishing a nationwide cohesion commission that can put community building and inclusion and cohesion uh, at the heart of the UK's COVID. Uh, recovery. I'll post that uh, briefing into the chat now so anyone can read it if they're interested. Um, and uh, once again, before we go, a thank you to our speakers um, and all those who have contributed today. Um, Sir Kenneth, uh, Elisa OBE, uh, Councillor Ernest Ezra Juggy, uh, Councillor Promise Knight, uh, Baroness Williams, thank you so much for joining us. Um, how are you? Um, Abdul Haq, uh, Mason Light, thank you all uh, for your comments, uh, for being with us today, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. today. And of course, final thank you goes to the dozens and dozens and dozens, I think at one point we had 150 people in the room of people who joined us today. Um, I hope everyone has a great day, and let's all work together uh, and do everything we can as individuals, as organisations, uh, and as, as professionals in whatever place we are. Um, to uh, build those kind, inclusive, cohesive, resilient communities that I think everyone here has said is what they want. So thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thank you.